It's a live recording tonight for Thursday Light Live. So here we are at Open Temple Studios, and I'm Rabbi Lori Shapiro, and this is Thursday Night Live. Tonight's topic is personal exodus and Dina. And I was thinking personal exodus. We're going to get there in a second. And as we're beginning, I'm going to lay down some ground rules, talk a little Torah. But ostensibly, where we're going tonight is what is the personal journey that we have of going out somewhere? Where are we being launched into? To begin, whenever we start any sort of Torah, we have this incredible, incredible chumash. There are many different chumashim in our lives. This is one. It's the stone chumash. I always say whenever you begin studying Torah or any kind of text, always look on the spine and see who the publisher is. Because the publisher is going to give you a sense of the agenda of what's written inside. We always have to read critically and really know that Torah is, is really that, um, that incredible prism that uh, is the result of being refracted through through a source. So Torah is is our source today. And how does it reflect or refract through you? Mwah. This is a, an art scroll Masora. So this is very traditional interpretation. Some of what I'm talking about comes from this, but most of it doesn't. I just brought it up here tonight. Most of us know what this is. And if we don't, welcome. Baruch ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidshanu b'metzata v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Bam! Let's go and say a few words of Torah. When we begin with Thursday Night Live, I always start by saying, you know, this is a soul journey. And in order to move forward with a soul journey, let's lay some ground rules. So this is our covenant and our covenant for the limud, this tiny little limud I offer every week. First, this shiur should come from a place of love. So if it was a hard day, if there was a lot of stress, if there was traffic, if we were overburdened with responsibility, let's kind of take this time to clear it out and say this is a moment of Torah and I'm going to reclaim my place of love. And actually love and the concept of love is a ma major theme in Dina, so we're gonna talk about that too. Um, then we must open our hearts to transformation and we're going to learn how Dina had that transformation herself. So we must all be vessels of transformation. So let's let go of the klipa. Let's let go of like this hardened shell around us and allow this rebirth to happen as we come forward and go out. Next, I recommend getting a journal, legal pad, something you can write down questions or if you like lists or if you just like to kind of freestyle words, get it out. Let the, the geyser of the flow within shoot forward. Uh, when judgments arise, let them bubble to the surface, write them down. It's a different way of seeing. Thank you for visiting. And there are many different ways to do Jewish. Tonight we're going to hear of some different denominations that exist that might not be primary ones like Jewish renewal or Reconstructionist Judaism or Conservative Judaism. These are tenuot. These are just merely movements. Movements continue to happen. There are rising movements happening right now. And so let's offer an open heart to what is new and different and maybe outside of our comfort zone because maybe that will help us then find our way out to meet our kind. Lastly, remember, speaking of this denominationalism, Jewish denominationalism is at its essence a 19th century Jewish innovation when we started institutionalizing Judaism. But I argue Jewish denominationalism was just a sectarian sort of allegiance, whether you were a Moroccan Jew or a Mizrahi Jew or however you were a Jew. We're all just Jews. And that's the beautiful dynamic of Judaism. I don't want to um, have any kind of notion other than uh, Mordechai Kaplan's He's the, the kind of um, brain inspiration of the Reconstructionist movement who says Judaism is the evolving religious civilization of the Jewish people, which I love because we're always just becoming. That's really the idea is we just continue to become. And it's both an individualistic thing that we do in community. And the pillars of Judaism are really the concepts of behaving and believing, but it's the third one, belonging, that makes Judaism so unique, that to really allow us to manifest a Jewish identity, it's done in community. It's not sitting above a mountaintop, having a 
great contemplative moment with your navel and your breath. It's not as a mendicant or ascetic kind of giving up all your worldly possessions. We must belong, we must have belongings, and we must struggle with this concept of the cuerpo, of the body and other bodies that live in our mists. It's done in community. So with that, we move into what is at essence our beautiful story of Dina. Where are we though in the calendar year when we meet Dina? What I love is that we meet Dina right now under the full moon of Kislev. Like, wow, think about that. In the darkest of dark times of the year, when our days in the Northern Hemisphere are shortest, we meet Dina and her tiny little illuminative story under the full moon, under its incredibly generous light in the darkness that is what is is kind of bringing down this warmth from above and that's how we find ourselves in the dark it's our full kislev moon um we're also in that wonderful concept of pericope can you say pericope 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 is uh, greek to me it's a beautiful term that was given at the time of septuagint that um, explains away a tiny little self-contained story within Torah uh, that that you know might be like a hypertext warp into another another plane like like Parshat Balak is a pericope within the book of Numbers and here we have this self-contained story of Dina in the mists of the the Jacob story we get this this little pericope this little story about his daughter who is um kind of uh you know left out a little bit we'll talk about that so let's go into the text itself and we're not going to get far because it begins with the tetze the tetze i mean how many times in torah does the tetze even show up this might be it guys it's it's not very often that a woman or a daughter or maybe she's a teenager goes out Fetetze. I mean, this is the same root as Yetziat Mitzrayim. I know it's used a lot, but there are lots of words for going out. You know, you can asa, you can have a have kind of a doing, or you can have a, um, a, a like a lechi, you know, that someone was told to go. Um, but the Tetze, that's a very specific going out. That's not just like someone just is 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 strolling along. This is this is the the word for Exodus, one of the the two foundational pillars of, of what we take a pause to think about every week, which is Yitziat Mitzrayim and Bereshit, creation, right? So we have this young girl who actively, the Tetze, she actively goes out. I mean, how radical is that in the ancient world? Think about how many of us as teenagers could never get out of our houses. Now, I didn't grow up that way, um, but think about like, how when you're a young woman, the idea of going out, the idea of personal agency is, is so empowering and just so ripe with everything that is imminent and incipient in one's life. Here we have this beautiful story of this young woman coming of age and taking personal agency, vatetze, and she goes out. Now, this is significant. Why is it significant? We're going to get to the Rashi in a little bit of what happened before this when we had the reunion of Jacob and Esau. We famously, you know, I get ahead of myself, but maybe we should just go there because since we're there. Famously in the Rashi, we learned that at the reunion of Jacob and Esau, it says that Jacob went with his 11 children. And that's problematic. You know, what's the kasha? What's the kasha? Right? What's the problem with that sentence of his 11 children? Well, he had 12 he had 11 boys and one daughter, and that daughter was Leah's child. And so, or they, the commentary tells us it's Leah's child later on because Shimon and Levi go to um, uh, pursue a revenge killing for what is to happen, but I get way ahead of myself. Um, but I love the idea that it's Leah's daughter, Vitetze, when you look at the story that, um, that comes with uh, Leah and Rachel and the mandrake and the idea of Leah's you know, fertility and Leah's, um, you know, the body of Leah that she has, you know, but Leah, but Leah. And what is her name? Dina, right? The idea of God has judged me and gives her a daughter, which I, I want to convert into a positive, that there was this beautiful reckoning that Leah had had only daughters, only sons. And so she now merited to have a daughter. 
because daughters are awesome. So, Fetetse Dina, okay, this this daughter of God who judges goes out. So there's 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 a this is a weighted this is a girl who is given a, a weighted identity. And oh, we haven't completed the midrash of earlier where Dina, upon the reunion of Jacob and Esau, when Jacob wrestles with this this ish this this angel ish man character, um, we're told that Dina is not there. And in the Rashi, why they ask? Because they say she was kept in a box. Ancient world, not known for feminism. And what is this kind of like box? And some of the commentaries, I, I think I read in Nachmanides and the Ramban, that she was left in the box because um, Jacob was worried that she was going to um, be taken as Esau's, Esau's wife, right? That perhaps Leah had been promised to Esau because um, Jacob had been promised to Rachel. And so naturally the daughter of Leah would then go to Esau. And so Jacob didn't want this daughter to be given over to Esau. And so he boxed her up. But really, I have to say in, in, a, in a 2019, 57, 80 sort of commentary, I don't think any of us are really comfortable with this idea of putting anyone in a box. It's kind of like reminds me of Dirty Dancing. No one puts baby in the corner, right? No one puts Dina in a box. And that's why just a few pasukim later, you find that this young woman, Vitetse, is going out. What was, we have to pause and ask, the trauma that she had had by being put in a box? What um, hungers did she have to finally go and manifest and take herself beyond? What identity yearnings did she have? What was her experience in this box? Um, it's ripe. It's ripe with potential. It's ripe with the potential of Midrash yet to be written. Uh, Nita Diamet wrote a beautiful book, The Red Tent, which is a Midrash, a modern day Midrash on the story of Dina, right? But there is so much yet to be written. We're going to go there. Let's keep reading about her. Okay, so Vetetse Dina, she went out. Bat Leah, the daughter of Leah, there we learn it as well. Asher Yalda Leakov Lirot Bivnot Haaretz, because she's looking. She's looking for the other daughters of the land, right? How many, how many times in our lives are we kind of in this box of life like you know right now I'm, I'm a carpool mom of two young kids and I bring them to these schools where all of these moms and dads are kind of put together because we chose this education for our children and it's kind of a, a, a contrived assortment of human beings and every day we see one another and there, there are great riches of the people who are there and sometimes there's this yearning as a parent like like, I just need to get out of this box. I just need to go out. I need to see what else is there, right? That yearning of going beyond. This is Dina. This is Dina energy. And so we learn, and she's going to find her people, right? That's really what she is. She's looking for the daughters of the land because she's like, hello, am I the only one? What? What? She's searching for something inevitably to be found inside, but we don't know because we're never going to hear from her again. But but really, when we go on that journey that's so deep inside of us and we kind of leave our comfort zone for something new. And remember, her father, the Yetze, just two Torah portions ago, he went out, right? And he was on a destiny journey of fulfillment. And here, apples and trees not falling far from her father's journey. Vitetse, she's going out to find her people. She's going out to meet her destiny. She's going out. Ve'yar ota Shechem ben Chamor. So Shechem, son of Chamor. Ha'chitvi. He's a Hittite. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, I did it. That always happens. You know, Torah does it itself. And it comes later on in um, in the Parsha with Yosef when he's, I think it's Vishlach, when he's um, he's uh, traded from the Hivites and the Hittites. Even Torah itself confuses those two. And Rashi kind of tries to clean it up for us. So um, there I go. Confusing the Hittites and the Hivites. <laughs> All right, so he, he's a son of the Hivites, and it says that he is a Nasi, so he's like, oh, oh really important. He's some sort of chief or prince, um, Haaretz of the land. So he's he's kind of this, you know, a Nasi Haaretz, like, whew, that's a power, right? A Nasi Haaretz, like the Nasi, when you think of like later, late temple periods, the Nasi was a, a rising hierarchy in the temple, and this guy's a Nasi Haaretz, 
Haaretz being the generative land, right, of our peoplehood, where all of the pulsation, right? There's something very carnal. There's something very carnal about Shechem. Even his name, Shechem, you know? He's got, oh, he's got this kind of virility. He's a nasi, a prince of the land, right? He knows the pulsation of life, right? And so then it, what do we learn about him? Vayikachota. He takes her. And same verb, vayikach, used for Abraham taking Avram, taking Sarai. Vayikach, we know, is a metaphor. It's to take, but it's also like boom, chicka, boom, that he, like, really acquires her. Kach, mimeni, like, take her. So there's an idea that she was acquired first, and then it says, vayishkav ota vayaneha, right? And that's where things get problematic. So it says first that he takes her, which is a euphemism for consorting with her, but it also is a, a, a verb that is, is generally understood even in, I believe, Maseke Kedushin as kind of a, a precursor of ancient biblical acquisition of someone as a wife. And then it, it says that he lay with her, and this is the word that's controversial for Vayishkav Ota has a sense of objectification that perhaps she's objectified because you have that um, uniquely Hebraic word et, that untranslatable direct object pronoun that comes afterwards. So Vayishkav Ota means she had an objectified manner of being laid with. And then there's um, Vayaneha, that he, he, he lay with her by force or he had some sort of um, lording over her or, or injury towards her through this laying with her. He got a little rough or something. So that's a packed full of sentence. Um, first, he gazes upon her. We learn of his might, of him being mighty of the land. And then he all these verbs happen to her. She's taken, she's laid with, she's injured, she's hurt, she's, she's, um, she's taken by force. And then we get the tida, um, the tid bear naf show, all right, being strongly drawn to Dina. That's what we learned, but Dina. The t oh, the tid bake. I knew that didn't make sense. Vatid big enough show. This is so huge. So all these things happen to her, and I don't know if we have like some sort of syndrome where the the one who is lording over the other starts having affection for her, or if there isn't just this kenyan, this deep connection of these two. You know, we learn very little of Dina, but we know she went out, so she's out there. And then this young man has this physical experience with her, and then it. It says the Tid Beknaf show, like his his soul is is clinging to her. So something happened, whether she was very beautiful, and that's why Jacob boxed her in, whether she had some sort of like dynamic allure, something made this man kind of cling to her. So he clinged to Bat Yaakov. He was clinging to Dina, the daughter of Jacob. And then it says right and this young man the yehav after all of this kind of um physical sense of 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 lording over this woman he clings to her and then you get like this incredible and he loved her right and he loved her that word isn't used very often right it's used for Isaac and Rebecca, um, I don't know if, I don't, I don't recall it being used even for Jacob and Rachel. And here you, you get it for Shechem and Dina. There's love there. He loves her. But to Deber al um, Lev Hana'ar, right? He spoke to the maiden tenderly. So he has this incredible, I don't know if this is like the after rough, rough consorting experience. I don't know if this is. Um, you know, he has a change of heart. I don't know if um, she was really feisty herself and they had this physical thing and afterwards in this afterglow, he, he's tender towards her and he draws her close and he loves on her and speaks tenderly. I mean, this is really like a slice of life pasuk of tenderness in the ancient world. We get that first pasuk above of like all these things that happened to her however you know there's a ton of commentary of whether or not dina was raped i would like to think that maybe she was our first really physical feminist who enjoyed sex i mean that's radical to say but 
why shouldn't she be the matriarch of sensuality? I mean, Lynn Gottlieb, a beautiful renewal rabbi, speaks of, of, of Dina going out in search of perhaps um, other ancient Near Eastern goddesses and that there had been this attachment to this this feminine sexual power that young women had they were they were so um, curious about the power of the concept of the ancient Near Eastern fertility goddess and the power that they possessed as a betula as a as a virgin that that Dina went out because she had sexual curiosity and that her story is really a coming of age story of saying that I run towards that sexual life force of Haaretz and I found the prince of Haaretz and I am going to to drink and imbibe and celebrate the physicality of being alive maybe that's what Dina is why must it always be so chastened or why must we be ruinous about human sexuality yes there are some grammatical and lingual suggestions that Dina was in fact raped or rough housed. Um, but I, but I, I then have to say, yes, we equally have a pasuk of great tenderness towards this young woman. So within those two pasukim lies the truth. And a part of what compels me with Dina right now is the idea that in the ancient Near East, young women knew of their sexual prowess and power and they knew as this idea of a concept of the Israelite God of Yah arises, they knew that prior to this very masculine concept of God, there existed an antecedent that was a feminine goddess, a goddess of fertility, a goddess of life, and that perhaps just Dina was trying to taste or reclaim or embody a little bit of what existed in the time of Asherah, the time of these ancient Near Eastern goddesses of fertility. And perhaps she is a bit of the appropriation and a bit of the empowerment that comes with it. But alas, a little bit of fire is a very dangerous thing. And as we know what happens, what happens with Dina is a great ambiguous tragedy of consequence of revenge killings, of honor killings, and it comes from her blood brothers, Shimon and Levi. You know, I'm going to weave in a little bit of Gloria Steinem on this because there's a statement that, that Gloria says, and she says, a pedestal is as much a prison as any small confined space. I'm going to read it again. A pedestal is as much a prison as any small confined space. So Dina goes from that box that her father had put her in to being put on a pedestal by Shechem. And she's in between these two extremes of being kind of, you know, shut off from all of existence to having personal agency and going out and getting caught in the other extreme, which is being put on the pedestal of love of the Nasi, you know, the, the head, the chief, the prince of the land, right? Like, those are two extremes. We never meet Dina the moderate. We never meet Dina like kind of um, kind of the one who has has kind of processed all of these extreme journeys until you get to Anita Diamonds, The Red Tent. Please read it, Modern Day Midrash. It's just beautiful. So then we go, as we know, Shrem says, I want to get this girl as my wife. And Jacob hears that this daughter, Time, Etadina, right? Another one, this idea of defilement. We, we, we have to like, see the way that she's perceived and and then ask what was her experience because for others it was seen as a big no and i have to think if you were put in box by a father and then loved and held close and uh, close and spoke tenderly by a guy that's like you know the king of the land i'd have to say um i don't know if she was entirely defiled I think it's complex, but we know that Jacob is not cool with what happened. We know that his sons are not cool. We know that Hamor, the son of Shechem, comes to Jacob and really asks, you know, I want to acquire this young woman for my son as a, as a wife. And the negotiation that goes on and um, ostensibly what happens, all of the men of Shechem are asked to circumcise themselves. That's the negotiation point, right? That they have to basically convert.
but it's not, they really don't speak of it as conversion. They, they say that you have to like circumcise yourself. So there's something additionally sexual about requiring an entire other people to take upon themselves this, this dismemberment of the member. Like there, there's something sec like highly charged going on in Shechem at this time. I mean, it's kind of profound. And as the men are convalescing, kind of reminiscent of Avraham, right? Avraham, Avinu, as he is in this convalescence post his circumcision, we now have an entire peoplehood that are in this lame, diminished state because the member of the sexual energy has been transformed. When they're in that vulnerable state, Shimon and Levi attack and kill them all. Like, how has this not been turned into a major motion picture yet? I mean, this is racy stuff. This is the implications of what happened there. I mean, if you look that it was a people who worshipped an ancient Near Eastern goddess who were then being attacked by this god of Yah over a sexual act... What was the role in the ancient Near East of human sexuality? Was it as conservatively a stigma as it is today? I mean, we live in really strange, amazing, and strange times. Like, you know, the appropriation of pronouns and everyone kind of now kind of reassigning how we identify based on our gender and not who we want to sleep with, right? It used to be, you know, either I'm gay or I'm straight, meaning that was really defining who we like to spend time in bed with. And is that really a way for us to define ourselves? Interesting, right, to ask that question. And now we've kind of moved forward to a time that, hey, okay, it really doesn't matter who I want to sleep with. We're not going to talk about that. I'm going to tell you what my pronouns are and how my gender identity should be understood. So I identify the pronouns of she, her, and hers, right? So that's how you can know who I am. And as far as like all that other stuff of who I like to lie with, not important as for how I identify. Let's talk about my pronouns, right? That's the power of language. And that's the way it's rising in our society today. It's fascinating. And I argue that the story of Dina is an antecedent to all of this conversation. The language is so specific, so subtle, and so so incredibly precise. The the in, indignities that that happen, the 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 incidents that occur towards her, um, you know, both caught up in in the language of aggressive physical prowess, as well as like the tenderest post pillow talk, like a, a, of adoration, intimacy, and love. Language is highly charged. Language is there. You know, words for defilement like time, vaishkavota, vayaneha, right? Defiled and in, like treated horribly, raped, right? Versus language like vetida bek nafsho badina bat yakov ve'ehav et hanaar, vedeber alev hanaar, right? He was strongly drawn to Dina, daughter of Jacob, and in love with her. And he spoke to her tenderly. He clung to her. He loved her. We have both here. We have both. And so I wonder in all of it, where is the voice of Dina? And I wonder in all of it, how do we find our voices? Judith Plaskow in Standing Again at Sinai has a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful statement on Midrash. She reminds us Midrash is not a violation of historical canons, but an enactment of commitment to the fruitfulness and relevance of biblical texts. The discovery of women in our history can feed the impulse to create Midrash. Midrash can seize on history and make it religiously meaningful. Remember and inventing together help recover the hidden half of Torah, reshaping Jewish memory to let women speak. And so, in closing, the Tetze Dina, Dina goes out, and she is still going out and helping every single woman with a voice to reclaim that voice, to stand in our power, to understand that we have agency, that we bear significance, that we 
empower one another through holding one another up, that we have authority over our lives, that we are sexual beings, that we have bodies and the bodies have songs to sing and tales to tell. This really is about so much of understanding Dina is really understanding what has yet to be written in Torah. And so as we go out tonight, my blessing is for us to continue writing the story, to write it in the risk that you are taking, to identify deeply with our Judaism and to take that identification and to be inspired by Torah song and then to keep the story written by the lyricism of our lives. And that is my Torah tonight. May we all be blessed. May we all bear significance. And may we end with this final, final idea, which is this prayer we say every morning. And it is one of the innovations of prayer. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam she'asani betzalmo. Blessed are you, this incredible creator of the universe who has created me in your image. And now here I am continuing to write your story. Blessings.